joining from all different parts of the world. Um, I, I encourage you to grab a drink and, uh, you know, a drink of choice, whether that's a coffee for those of you who are having your morning or afternoon coffee. Um, I guess if you're, <laughs> if it's the evening for you, don't drink coffee <laughs> uh, and join us for this ride. Uh, as a first order of business, I just want to remind everyone that this event is being recorded. Um, I'm Moussa Traoré and I work in USAID's Center for Economics and Market Development, and I focus on, uh, the, on business environment reform. Uh, I want to welcome you to this third installment of this summer webinar series hosted by our Center for Economics and Market Development. This event is brought to you through our trade and competitiveness activity uh, implemented by Resonance Global and hosted on our Market Links platform. Uh, through this webinar series, we want to promote dialogue with the international development community, including bilateral and multilateral development partners, implementers, technical experts, the private sector, and other stakeholders about new uh, challenges for economic growth. Uh, we are hoping to brainstorm collectively and contribute to a broader conversation on best practices, lessons learned, and challenges and opportunities for enterprises to recover and thrive economically because firms are the primary engines of growth in most economies. For this conversation, our theme is building public trust to improve the business environment. And today we're trying something a little new. Uh, this webinar will have a slightly different format than the others in our series. Um, it has more of a conversational format. Um, there won't be any slide presentations, just talk. Uh, think of it a bit like an interactive uh, live podcast recording. Uh, and if you like this format, uh, we'll look into doing more events like this. Uh, we've got some great guests for you today uh, for the discussion. So engage with us in this conversation over the next 90 minutes. And thanks for joining us for what we hope is going to be an engaging conversation. Margo, over to you. Thank you. Good morning from Washington. I'm Margo Katonis. I am a communicator and change management practitioner. Musa and I are colleagues in the same unit at USAID, uh, so I'm your co-host. Um, now, I am here as sort of the layman or laywoman's perspective because, as we know, trust between government and the private sector in development is a really broad, hefty topic. And oftentimes, both sides use communications as a primary means of promoting transparency and building relationships. I'm going to be the one who's going to ask for clarification from all of our super experienced um, guest speakers here. So um, don't be shy to message me directly in the chat. If you want me to ask anything on your behalf, uh, feel free to message everyone, certainly, but I am here for you, for everybody. So speaking of the chat, if you are on your computer and using Zoom, you'll see the chat icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can open that up and you can do the drop down selection to chat everyone. That's going to chat all of our attendees right now. We have about 60 of you. Um, we would request, if you wouldn't mind, please introducing yourselves in the chat. If you could just say who you are, where you're joining from, and um, your organization, so we can sort of get to know who is attending this event about trust with us. <clears throat> so as for just a few other short logistics, um, the production team is going to be sharing resources that uh, we're mentioning in the chat box. All of our attendees are also welcome to share any resources that you think the audience or the panelists um, would appreciate. Because the second thing, because we do have a big audience joining us today, all of the microphones um, and cameras are automatically muted. Um, so again, please uh, just use that chat function. We're going to be keeping a really close eye on it. I have it up right now, which is why I'm looking left and right. Um, we are going to be answering questions on a rolling basis, and many of you did provide questions during the registration, so we're going to try to get to those as well. And then finally, last thing about logistics, um, as we mentioned earlier, this is a new format, so before you disconnect, uh, whenever you have to hop off, uh, our production team is going to be dropping a survey link for basically how you like this format, things that you might want to change, any technical issues. Um, so our production team, Abby Pellon, just dropped it in there. Feel free to save that uh, for whenever you have to drop off. Thank you. Thanks, Margot. Um, I see that we've had a few more people trickle in. So I want to obviously remind people again that the, the webinar is being recorded. Thank you for joining us. Um, and I think it's time to get the show on the road. Um, so I think, Margot, we should probably start the, the conversation out a little generally. 
Um, so I, I, I thought, you know, just to start off, uh, to ask you um, from your own experiences, professional and otherwise, what do you believe are the elements or the hallmarks of trust? Um, and this is a good role for me starting generally and as a communicator having worked in the development space for about a decade now, uh, because as I mentioned earlier, communications is often used for this relationship building, <clears throat> for sharing and understanding of what a particular organization's incentives are. And I say that because I want to talk about it uh, quickly. So when I think about trust, um, I think about coming to the table with good intentions and then taking a step to assume that the people across the table from you are also coming with good intentions. And that is not an automatic response. Um, and it's really, really difficult. And it's part of the reason why trust is difficult because maybe you don't know the organization across the table. Maybe you've been burned in the past by a similar organization or um, you know, a different leadership within the current organization you're working for. There are so many different ways to sort of uh, deteriorate trust and, and to build it is really an active exercise. Um, so, you know, it's completely relationship based, but oftentimes I ask us to look at ourselves. I want to build a trusting relationship. I need to have faith. I need to put something out there. And so then this is my final thought. I was talking about in sentence earlier. When there is no basis for trust, or maybe we're trying to rebuild it, you can consider the incentives that you know your partner might have for themselves. And then assume that they understand what your incentives are for the relationship as well. Now, this seems like a little kind of like a depressing thought, or maybe it's a little cynical, but I really do believe, and I was thinking about this last night, that if you're having a difficult time, your organization's having a difficult time trusting the folks across the table, do an incentive research exercise and say, well, listen, maybe I don't know how they're gonna act, but I sure as heck know what they want out of this. And I'm gonna assume that they know what I want out of this. And at least you can meet in the middle there. So I'll end there, Musa. So I, I really like the way that you, you went about kind of explaining what you think that the major elements are. And, and I think a lot of the elements that you mentioned matter a lot for building a business enabling environment, right? And I think I, I particularly like that you put emphasis on the fact that trust is relationship based. And for me, part of the, you know, the discussion that I want to have today is about the fact that trust changes, right? It, it's not something that is static. Um, and you obviously alluded to this, you made reference to knowing what the other person is thinking or what the other side is thinking. Um, and avoiding kind of that situation where one might be hiding the ball, because from the moment that you pick up on someone else hiding the ball, that implies a, a level of risk or concern that you might be some, somehow being had, right? Um, and so I, I appreciate that, you know, you kind of alluded also to the need for transparency and to accountability in this kind of trust relationship. Um, and, and, you know, I, I particularly like the connection that we can make here to the context of the enabling environment. Investing in or running a business is always a risk, right? And investors and entrepreneurs won't take the risk or will outright exit the formal market if the burdens are too high. And the risk calculation, they, they depend on so many factors, right? The factors range from whether there's competition and even an, an even playing field between the competing businesses, the complexity and the cost, of complying with the regulations, uh, the transparency of the rules, which is something that you kind of mentioned, the rules of engagement, uh, general notions of fairness in the marketplace, and whether the market conditions actually induce businesses to engage in illicit activities. So I'm just naming a few here, right? These are all factors that make up the fabric of the trust relationship between the private and public sectors and within the private sector itself. Ultimately, that trust relationship matters because an environment that is conducive to doing business promotes entrepreneurship, um, an increase in the number of new firms entering the market, uh, improvements in existing firm growth, and overall greater investment. And this basically translates into more jobs in the market, which helps reduce inequality and poverty, which is the ultimate goal that we're all striving for here in the development space, right? Um, more formal businesses also means increased government revenue. Um, and all this ultimately allows countries to better advance their own development. Also, favorable business conditions empower a more vibrant private sector 
to provide innovative solutions to development challenges, either by investing in key sectors like health, education, energy, or contributing their knowledge to improving uh, development prospects overall. So many of you probably know that we at USAID launched a new economic growth policy uh, last year in 2021. And that policy updates our former economic growth strategy from 2008. Um, our new policy is a firm-centered policy that focuses on promoting the growth of firms of all sizes, with particular focus on SMEs. So um, I'd like us to have a, a quick poll here about you know, uh, the importance of SMEs. Um, and so I, I think you all will probably see this poll pop up on your screens. And the poll question that's appearing um, is about SME's contribution to the share of businesses and employment worldwide. So I, I'd like you to just take a few seconds to kind of respond to this, to fill in the blank, basically, if you can. Uh, I'll give it just a minute. And then just really quickly um, for everybody, because we have a pretty big audience right now, SME means small and medium sized enterprises. So that means there's usually a limitation on the size here. These aren't the big multinational corporations. So apologies if that's redundant to our <laughs> include in audiences, but just for any newcomer who, who might think, um, you know, subject matter experts, this is small and medium sized. Thank you. Enterprises. Thanks so much, Margo. I'm, I'm glad you're here for that because I think sometimes we can get a, a little too much into the jargon and, and not clarify things for, for others in the audience. So thanks for doing that. Um, and so if uh, I, I, I'm guessing by now, most people have responded um, to the, the, the poll. Um, and and I just like maybe if we could get confirmation of that and kind of have the results. And you can see the results there in front of you. And just to kind of go over, it, it seems like the majority of you got this right. According to the World Bank, SMEs represent 90% of businesses and more than 50% of employment worldwide. Formal SMEs contribute up to 40% of national income in emerging economies. And I, I wanted to talk about this because it underscores the need for creating a trust relationship between the public and private sectors uh, to promote economic growth, so. So what do you think then are the priority areas businesses are actually concerned about? Or, or like, what are some of the priority areas for building trust, Musa? So I think there are probably too many to name, but there are a few that immediately come to mind for me. Um, I, I think, first of all, fairness and facility of trade, how easy it is to trade, because, you know, trade both in commodities and information. So when I say information, I'm digital, e-commerce, et cetera, makes the world go round. I think we 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 know that. And I think fairness and in in and having trust in that kind of relationship is is quite important. The other thing is taxation, um, because the evidence has shown that improving tax regulation, both tax policy and the process of paying taxes even without adding any other incentives, is the biggest motivator for new businesses to register or formalize. It's something that we detailed in uh, our SME evidence review that we did. And that SME evidence review was actually uh, featured in one of our former, uh, our past events. Um, it was a market links event. And so our production team will drop the link there for you. Uh, so you can go back and look at that event, but you also will have the link directly to the SME evidence review. The other, uh, I, I have two more. The, the, the other, I think, would be courts um, because they offer remedies when things go wrong uh, for businesses and in investors, right? And if I'm going to take, you know, any kind of risk, <laughs> I want to make sure that when things go wrong, that I'm going to have a remedy. Um, it's also, the courts are also where firms undertake a lot of their regulatory compliance, um, such as incorporation, uh, at least in a lot of civil law countries. Uh, property transactions, uh, civil uh, or, or insolvency uh, related issues and other regulatory processes that they may undertake at the courts. And then more generally, um, just the idea of competition, which would probably be the fourth that I would name. Um, there's, you know, obviously making sure that you have an even playing field, that you, you have, um, you know, the, the laws on the books that basically promote a competition uh, and, you know, a, a, an environment of competitiveness and competition. Um, and basically that businesses aren't being left behind, particularly the smaller businesses, uh, the ones that don't necessarily have the sway um, with the elites. 
So I think that's particularly important. But you know, we'll get to hear from um, some experts who are you know far better informed about this than I am, and far better informed about trust building. So um, I don't want to get too much ahead of of the discussion. So I'll I'll probably stop there. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm glad that you broke it out in four different points because I think that was helpful to follow along. So now I actually trust you when you're going to be getting the information. I know when it's going to start and stop. So it was a good little tactic there. Um, so you did mention our experts, and I, you know, we have these three folks on screen with us. Uh, Musa, would you mind before they introduce themselves, just telling us a little bit about them and maybe how you know them? Yeah, sure. Um, so first we have Frank Brown, who is here from SIP, which is the Center for International Private Enterprise. Uh, Frank works on anti-corruption and governance. We were introduced by another colleague and we got to chatting and I really thought, you know, his expertise, uh, both uh, in terms of, you know, work in the field and, and actual theory would lend itself very well to this discussion. Um, and I think Frank will also bring a, a, you know, a particular perspective as somebody who was formerly a journalist. Um, and I think this is particularly interesting because again, the media plays an important role in kind of this trust relationship as well. Um, then we have Will Nielsen who works uh, with uh, the World Bank Group, is a consultant to the World Bank Group. He works on impact analysis related to economic inclusion and uh, public-private dialogue, among other things. Will and I know each other through um, the Donor Committee for Enterprise Development, um, where he's done quite a bit of work, uh, you know, doing various, uh, writing various reports that are commissioned by the Donor Committee for Enterprise Development, um, and uh, where the, the, the committee is essentially where myself and some other USAID representatives uh, represent USAID in the forum where donors exchange about, um, you know, private enterprise. And um, yeah, so Will and I got, that's how we were connected. And then we have George Kisa, who is USAID's mission, uh, who's with USAID's mission uh, in Kenya. He's the coordinator of the Young African Leaders Initiative in East Africa. And I'm so glad to have George with us today because I think he brings an angle about how you kind of create the, the uh, kind of the ground for trust in the future because of this initiative that he runs where he gets to work with a lot of young entrepreneurs, uh, a lot of uh, young public servants and uh, members of civil society and kind of, you know, working with them to understand the dynamics of you know um, a, a business enabling environment among other things the things that basically help them understand how to build that trust relationship so i'm really eager to hear from all three of our speakers today um and so i'll hand it you know back over to you margo oh yeah and i'm just going to quickly hand it back off so um <laughs> we're trying to uh make this like a nice, comfortable event for everybody. So being really transparent about uh, handing off the microphone. Um, but you will see just quickly for our audience. Um, first of all, thank you everybody for um, introducing yourselves. I think that's so awesome that the chat's been really active. I've seen some people be really excited to see, quote, see one another here. Uh, so it's really nice to sort of like build this cohort and, and just know who we're sitting with right now. Um, so I am going to ask Frank to please introduce yourself. Margot, thank you so much. Um, and it's, it's great to be here. Um, and this is a subject that's very dear to my heart, especially when I'm speaking to a group like this, because as Musa remarked, SMEs are absolutely essential when it comes to this. And when I say this, I mean specifically anti-corruption reform. So um, they, I'll, we'll get into this a little bit more, but they typically are the drivers of anti-corruption reform um, in environments like Ukraine or like Sudan, places I've done a lot of work where there's a window of opportunity that opens up. So great to be here, looking forward to the discussion and um, I'm hoping to learn a lot. Thank you. Um, Will, please go ahead. Great. Well, nice to be connected with everyone here today and I appreciate the invite. Uh, yeah, as, as Musa mentioned, you know, a lot of my work with the World Bank has been oriented towards these topics of economic inclusion. And so that's a big bucket, <laughs> you know, things like public private dialogue, uh, preferential public procurement, reforms to reduce informality. 
Uh, so moving across many topics, but a common thread across many of these topics has been this element of trust and how trust corresponds to the willingness of you know, a small firm to become formal or how public-private dialogue mechanisms foster social interaction between both sides of the table that then can help uh, support greater trust as well. Uh, so echoing Frank here, I was really excited about uh, hearing this, this webinar being developed um, and looking forward to learning more as we go forward here. Thank you, Will. And then George, please. Thank you, Margo and Musa. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Musa, for the introduction about that. I think one um, uh, thing I just want to probably add there is uh, uh, I'm excited to be part of this conversation because I I represent the majority. Uh, and when I say that is in, in the region uh, that I'm best in, in East Africa, and generally in Sub-Saharan Africa, young people uh, constitute two thirds to three quarters of the population. So obviously, uh, their perspective is very important. We have uh, gained some uh, some insights, some uh, learned a lot from interacting with young leaders from the region. And I think this kind of topic is important uh, first because uh, young people are most affected by the business environment uh, first, uh, either directly as uh, uh, as entrepreneurs themselves, but also indirectly because when uh, a, a business environment obviously is not conducive, then there's no growth and so job opportunities for young people are limited. But again, also they are also the next generation of, uh, of leaders like uh, Musa mentioned. So obviously they can help also shape this in the future. So I'm very excited to be part of this conversation. Back to you, Margo. Thank you. Don't uh, lose your mute buttons quite yet. So I'm gonna ask the speakers the same question. And actually for the audience, this question is gonna go to you if you can get your thoughts and your keyboards ready in the chat. So I'm asking everybody on this call to try to define trust in one sentence. So for our attendees, um, just think about it and type it into the chat, what that means to you, how you would define trust in this context in one sentence. And then I'm gonna turn it back to the speakers. For now, I'm gonna go in the same order because I want you to trust me and I don't wanna psych anybody out. Um, that's not guaranteed for the rest of the event though. So I will start um, with Frank, if you can define trust in one sentence, please. So trust for me is, is reaching a point where people are willing to consider acting against their own self-interest. Wow, thank you, Will. If this were if this were a poetry slam, I would totally be snapping my fingers right now. That was a really good answer, Frank. Oh my goodness. That was like a very romantic, like um, almost like a knight, medieval knights kind of honor, honor vibe. Please, Will. Yeah, I don't know if I can talk that one. Um, I'll say, you know, trust is that certainty that someone will act cooperatively and reliably when we don't necessarily know for certain that they will. Very good. And then George, please. Um, perhaps a short one. Uh, what, what you see is what is there. That's uh, my definition of trust. I think uh, essentially that uh, what I'm presenting or I'm seeing is really what is there and there's nothing hidden under the table. Thank you. I, I, because we, we have some things that have come in um, in the chat as well, I, I just want to point to something that Noemi, um, you know, put out here, and, and it might not be visible to everyone because it was sent to the hosts and panelists, but they said reciprocity and honesty, and I think that's quite, you know, it's, it's, it's succinct and it's kind of um, to the point, and I, and I like it quite a bit, but I wanted to also share it with a broader audience because everybody might not be seeing it, so... Thanks. Um, thank you all for, you know, for, for kind of leading us through that, um, you know, that discussion of how you, you define trust in, in one sentence. It's no easy task. I took four elements, to, you know, to kind of define mine, but we put all of you in the hot seat. Um, 
So, you know, discuss, discussing the principles and concepts of uh, trust presents opportunities to improve our work as development practitioners and to review and align our work with good practices and co-create an improved business environment where entrepreneurs and innovators can thrive and grow. So this discussion is a great opportunity to exchange and deepen our mutual understanding of how to build trust between governments and business. And this is really where we we kind of pivot to the to the to if you will the the meat of of our agenda today, where we basically start the conversation. Um, and you all will remember what Margot said earlier. Feel free to chime in in the chat if you have specific questions and comments. We won't be able to get to everything, but we will we will obviously try to 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 answer some questions um, and to reiterate some some of the comments that come through. So just starting off to set the stage, I have a question for Will. Um, in 2020, you and some of your World Bank colleagues published a paper titled Trust Between Public and Private Sectors, The Path to Regulatory Compliance. So first hats off to uh, all of you because the paper is an excellent foundational piece uh, with lots of practical guidance that helps us set the stage for this conversation. So Will, Expanding on your one sentence from before, how do you define trust and what is the general state of uh, public private trust globally? And Will, just I would also tap on to that question. How do we measure trust practically? Great. Yeah. <laughs> Tough questions. <laughs> but I think, you know, from from maybe a more academic lens, trust is this response to asymmetrical information between two sides. So this, in this case, between public and, and private sectors. Uh, so that's just to say, you know, we don't necessarily know everything about what the other person is thinking or doing. Um, and so trust helps us overcome that, that lack of information. Uh, that we often have. And so it's filling in that gap between that absolute certainty of, of an outcome uh, and, and the decision to pursue the outcome in the first place too. Uh, and so within that, with whenever trust is involved, there, there's risk as, as Mosa you were describing earlier as well. Um, but that, that greater trust level just signifies the greater belief we have that we feel confident in in the outcome of this of the transaction whatever form that transaction may take uh, and so let's see when <laughs> thinking about the best way to explain this uh, if if we start to see that information asymmetry that that uncertainty grow between uh, two parties we, that's where we start to sense distrust or that, that is kind of the representation of the presence of, of distrust. So that can be responded to in multiple ways then as well. If, if the gap between, if there starts to become this gap or greater amounts of uncertainty come into play and we have elements of distrust starting to come into the transaction, then that can signal the response of different mechanisms or approaches to help close that gap and reduce that uncertainty. Could be things like increased enforcement or uh, you know, more lengthy and detailed contracts. Uh, and so in, in many ways, trust is, is uh, kind of a, a tool for efficiency in that way. It, it's helping to reduce transaction costs in many cases. Uh, and so when you have those high levels of trust, you, uh, you can do things faster oftentimes. Um, but, and so that's just to say, you know, maybe more generally this concept of trust and why I think it, this topic is so interesting is because it's so pervasive and a constant in our day-to-day -day lives. It, it is a part of every, every component of what we're doing. Um, even as we're sitting here now, we're trusting that our computers and our internet are going to continue operating. We're trusting that you know cars are going to stop at, at the red light as we're walking across it. Um, and so when we think of trust, we associate it with generally positive outcomes. 
Uh, and in the research, I think we've, we've generally seen that association hold true. So in places where we see higher trust levels, we tend to see that positive correlation with things like higher GDP per capita, greater amounts of innovation, uh, greater tax compliance amongst you know, many other uh, kind of prized social and economic indicators. Um, so trust is, is a constant in our day-to-day -day life and it's also uh, something that can be really nice to have. Um, in terms of the state of trust, there, there are a lot of measures in place around the world. There's some international level studies that are out there that are doing you know, annual measures of trust. Um, I think in the past decade, we've tend to see on an international level, a net decline in trust overall. Um, within that though, there's a lot of variation. Um, there's, there's country level variation where in some countries, for example, in the US, we've seen some rather dramatic declines in trust. Uh, in, in other countries though, there have been increases in trust. So it, there's a lot of contextual variation. Um, and, even, and within countries too, of course, it can vary quite a bit as well, just as we start to disaggregate uh, the population too. So in some cases, what we've been seeing recently is this divergence between different populations, whether that is uh, political parties, folks who associate with themselves with different political parties are having diverging amounts of, of trust in public private interactions. Um, similarly, income can be a uh, classification that really shows differing amounts of trust. Um, so there's a lot of variation there. Uh, I guess, I guess, well, I do have a question that's related. So I guess th there's obviously the, the angle that we can take where we look at trust as a perception based, um, you know, kind of situation where you, you know, there, there's a general perception um, and that leads to or doesn't lead to trust. But then there are also things that are just facts, right? Um, like, um, you know, regulations and how they burden individuals um, or businesses and how that basically, you know, affects the trust relationship as well. So I don't, I don't know if you wanted to uh, make any, any distinctions there between the perception and, and, and the, you know, the real facts of what people have to deal with or if the literature says anything to that effect. Yeah, definitely. Well, and that kind of nicely ties into Margot's question as well with regard to the measurement approaches that are in play. Uh, so you can, you know, directly measure trust, which would be this, uh, you know, we go out and ask folks, how do you, how much do you trust the government? A lot, a little, not at all. Uh, that, that type of questioning is something that you see in a lot of these international studies. Uh, and they'll ask various folks, they might ask, what's your trust in private sector? What's your trust in NGOs and media, etc. cetera. Um, but then on the flip side, and I think this is kind of corresponding to what you're saying, this is this um, more indirect measures where we're looking at uh, revealed behaviors. And that can be a reflection then of the, the true, you know, lay of the land state of regulation. If, if, um, uh, if there's a perception of corruption, that may be a signal of uh, directing activities in, to other outlets. So avoiding, if, if you see opportunities to take a, a route that involves less corruption, that might be then a signal or a revealed behavior there where we see folks taking a, a different direction. And so that, that can be a potential way to, to measure the level of trust in the relationship between those, those two potential parties then as well. Is Thanks so much. I, I, I really like that what you said about revealed behaviors because I think I was also trying to find the perfect language to, to, to kind of say, there's obviously this perception and then there, there are actual things that happen that you base um, you know, your, your view of, of you know, a, another party on, right? And, and, I, and I like that terminology revealed um, behavior. So I'm gonna try to commit it to memory for the future. Um, I have another question for you. You're not out of the hot seat yet. Um, our USAID administrator, Samantha Power, is a major proponent of leveraging behavioral economics to inform international development. And I know you've worked on issues at the nexus of economics and behavioral science at the World Bank. 
Um, how is behavioral economics relevant to building trust? And then just quickly to Will and others, um, I think I know Frank has a point about this as well, but for the audience's benefit, Will, in addition to Moose's question, can you just help us understand what behavioral economics is? Certainly, yeah. So I'd say behavioral economics generally is we're combining these economics concepts with a variety of other fields. So that may be psychology, uh, sociology, anthropology. Um, and so when we're, maybe as an example, when we're thinking about like a classic microeconomic situation, say there's a business that is working to uh, maximize marginal benefit, this being sort of your classical microecon uh, example. In, in theory, we would say maximizing marginal benefit is, is maximizing profitability, right, for the enterprise. Um, but with, with the lens of behavioral insights and behavioral econ, we're trying to really add in all the other factors that are in play in, in this case, a business manager's decision making. Um, at the time of making a decision, there are going to be emotional factors. Uh, in play to varying amounts, there will be social norms that may often uh, guide their decision making, cultural factors, uh, as well as um, cognitive biases. So just general, uh, you know, shortcuts that our mind takes to help uh, speed up the, the ability to make decisions without having to have everything turn into a, a huge, a huge undertaking. Um, when I say that, that is really just connecting to this idea that behavioral economics is recognizing that we all operate with bounded rationality, where there's there's this uh, it would be like perfect economic rationality is the, in the case of the business they're maximizing profitability, but um, due to these factors, these emotional factors, social uh, norms. Uh, as well as things like, um, you know, I just don't have time to run a cost benefit analysis on every decision I have to make. We all end up operating in this somewhat less economically rational state. Uh, and so behavioral econ is helping to recognize all those different factors that are in play and understand how both how, where they exist, how they're influencing decision making. And then after running these diagnostics to help understand their, the presence of these factors, that's when you start to see things like, like nudges, as they're often referred to, that end up um, altering the, de the decision making or the choice architecture. There's a lot of behavioral econ jargon out there too, um, but uh, those nudges then help influence the, the emotional factors, the social norms, the cognitive biases that an individual may have. Um, maybe I'll so, touch on one so, real quick here too that that uh, I think corresponds to the trust piece uh, a lot here. And so within this behavioral econ mindset is there's a few key ideas uh, about people that are important, and that is that people often think automatically. Uh, and so we look for mental shortcuts oftentimes to help ease decision making, make decision making faster. And uh, so trust being one of those potential mental shortcuts where when I don't have time to, you know, hire another lawyer or do another cost benefit analysis, I'm going to trust in the other party. And so this is this corresponds closely with this key factor. People like to think automatically. Um, and people often think socially. Uh, so in many cases, we like to cooperate. And in, in this trust space, there's this idea that people are generally conditional cooperators. You know, so I'll cooperate as long as you're cooperating too. Uh, and that facilitates the trust building relationship as well. Um, and then the last one I'll hit on is just this idea of uh, mental models that people have, everybody has different mental models. This, and this is just to say, we all have 
different uh, beliefs and different basic concepts of how we view the world and how we think the world should look and function that influence our, our behaviors as well. And so Behavioral Econ is trying to account for all these and facilitate that, uh, recognize how that plays into uh, allocating trust, especially within the public and private sectors. Thanks a lot, Will. So uh, before I hand it over to, to Frank, because I know Frank Frank will definitely have something to say about this as well. Um, you know, the way that I, I kind of conceptualize this is that general, and I want to preface this, I am not an economist. <laughs> I, I'm somebody with a law background. So, you know, just uh, for, for somebody to, to clarify this, if, if you have a better understanding, the way I see behavioral economics is general, economics theory assumes that people are rational actors and behave in a certain way. And when we tap into the idea uh, of behavioral economics, we kind of expand that understanding to say that there are actually a lot of things that may underlie why people make certain decisions. And like you say, um, social issues and um, psychology, et cetera. And that is basically what we kind of study to understand how we we try to build a, a trust environment is that is that right or is is that kind of um, at least more <laughs> or less on 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 the mark? Yeah, yeah, no, I'd okay. say yeah. yeah. Okay, I just I just wanted to make sure because I, I you know it, it, on, at least in, with regard to this, I'm also a, a layperson on on behavioral e economics, but I'm glad that we have an expert in the room. Frank, I'll, I'll hand it over to you to 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 also make some comments. Thanks, Musa. And thanks, Will. I'm really glad we're we're zeroing in on this because this is one of our central challenges at SIPE. And I'm I'm seeing a lot of pickup in the chat on this issue as well as it's and it's good to see a couple of colleagues from SIPE, one of whom uh, literally wrote the, the 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 short book on how to address some of these issues when it comes to mid-sized companies in emerging markets, how to how to encourage their employees to give less bribes, which is fundamentally what we're talking about. And another of whom works on our trade program in Colombia, building up trust in the trade sphere. Um, but I'll, I'll give you a quick anecdote to give you a sense of the challenges that, that we face. Um, so I was, another colleague who's in the chat uh, and I were in Pakistan, in Karachi, talking to textile manufacturers. And I was giving my standard speech about all the reasons why corruption and curbing corruption is, and is important. And I was citing these massive fines that come out of the US Department of Justice for violating the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. And I noticed about halfway through the presentation, the eyes were glazing over, they just weren't interested. And, and so I sort of paused and dug into it a bit. And it turns out they could care less about these fines because it's highly unlikely that they're going to be investigated in Pakistan. So we, we talked a little bit about what does motivate change. And they talked about all the positive things that can flow from putting in place anti-corruption compliance programs. And that, I, I relate that anecdote because it, it zeroes in on why behavioral economics is so important, because as we work with mid-sized businesses in emerging markets, their, their sort of choice architecture, as you put it, the nudges are often entirely different than we would find in the West. There's there maybe a weak rule of law, there's corruption, not only in the government and, and in, in the judiciary, but within the company itself, perhaps it's family owned, and perhaps it's much more important loyalties to the family rather than profit. So we're always trying to figure out what we, how we can incentivize company employees to give less bribes. And I think that behavioral economics, we've had some initial conversations about putting in place studies, especially in Africa and Eastern Europe. Um, that's the key for us to us understand what works and doesn't work. Unfortunately, it, it costs a good deal of money to do this. We, we haven't found the resources yet. We're still looking, but my, my great hope is that when we can begin to crack this nut, we'll begin to come up with solutions that aren't emerging from, from the, the Western countries, which tend to be the focus of, in, of interest within the private sector on corruption, because that's where all the penalties are, that's where the money flows from, but the, the risk is elsewhere. The risk is in emerging markets, and we have yet to figure out how to crack that nut. We have some good ideas, we're trying all kinds of things, but it's, it, there's a degree of sort of fumbling in the dark. I want to bring George into this conversation because what you know we're talking about behavioral economics and when I think about this I think of the term interventions that that both Frank and Will have talked about 
And, you know, talking to George about the YALI program, um, and I'm going to let him speak to this, just about like the networking that you facilitate, um, the connections that you're building, and frankly, like getting those future leaders into those positions where that trust needs to be built. I would love to, if you could just, you know, talk a little bit about like what practically that looks like and then how you believe maybe the YALI programs are actually like amazing, you know, interventions for this exact rub that we're talking about. Please, George. Thank you, Margo. I, um, yeah, so I think behind uh, all processes um, and procedures, behind policies are individuals and these individuals, uh, and, and that's why it's good to have also these conversations at, at the micro level. So um, the, the early program here in East Africa brings in young leaders from 14 countries in the region, uh, in the East Africa region. But Ayali, of course, is a, a program that is across the sub-Saharan um, uh, region covering 49 countries. So we've learned some, uh, some lessons. So essentially, uh, a typical cohort, for example, will bring in 100 young people, maybe 30 who are in the private sector, 30 of them uh, in, in uh, say, the public sector, and maybe another 40 or so from civil society. And so uh, there, there are some things we pick up from that on, on this topic of trust that are uh, beneficial. So usually young people come into the room and uh, in, in the early parts of the training, we have something we call, this is Africa. And in that conversation of this is Africa, we, we, we have conversations around what is ailing our continent, what is ailing our countries. And there's a lot of venting from, from these young leaders. And most of this venting is around uh, actually trust. So the pr private sector have a lot of trust issues towards the public sector. And then um, uh, there is, the private sector sometimes has a lot of disdain towards uh, civil society, the, uh, literally disdain. And then sometimes we find that uh, the, the public sector does not trust the, uh, the intentions of civil society, for example. And then the public sector also views the private se sector with a lot of perception. So there are a number of things that we've, we we learn from these processes as they engage and the trust grows over time. One of them is the element of perception that I know we've covered around here earlier on. The fact that uh, sometimes trust is, uh, is it lacks just because the players in a certain sector do not understand how the other sector works. For example, uh, in the private sector, things are efficient, they move very fast. When there's a delay, in engaging with a public process, the immediate instinct is to think maybe somebody wants corruption or whatever. Uh, someone may not know that uh, some uh, something needs to go through layers and layers of uh, bureaucratic approvals that are required maybe in law before that uh, uh, thing can go out. But that immediately obviously uh, creates a lot of uh, lack of trust in, in within that that particular context, and so. Uh, unless there are opportunities for players in the public sector, private sector, and civil society to engage, and I think YAL is what provides that kind of opportunities, they're able to engage, it becomes very difficult for people to understand this. I think the other uh, as aspect that comes in is that uh, sometimes you find in the in civil society, the perception towards uh, the private sector is, these are just people who only care about profit. Very few of them actually realize that uh, players in the in the private sector, and by the way, even the public sector has that perception about private sector. So many of them actually don't realize that many businesses are born out of someone wanting to address a social problem. And they see, as they're addressing a social problem, they're thinking of how do I address this sustainably? And in that process, a business is born and it grows and can become very profitable. But the angle that this business is addressing a social problem uh, sometimes can be lost in someone thinking these people are just interested in in this or the levet tax. They'll do this, they'll do that. So, so those kind of things obviously uh, need to be addressed. Of course, in in reality, especially in our region, there are other aspects where the individuals within the system are deliberately uh, taking actions, such as, as soliciting for bribes and so on. That are then uh, the the trust issues there are very uh, genuine. And then other, a third thing I just wanted to add is uh, one of the challenges that we tend to have, especially in uh, developing countries, is where 
the individuals in the public sector are the same ones in private sector is the same individual whose other leg or hand is in the civil society. So when there is this overlap or where the same person is playing in all three, then there will be a lot of uh, uh, trust issues, obviously. Some may be perception, but some are reality because they, uh, I'm in the private sector, I'm influencing policies so that they can favor my business. Um, I'm, I'm changing processes so they can favor my business. So I think being able to work towards moving these three cycles uh, further and further apart from each other so that you don't have uh, the same person playing in all the three uh, is another aspect that we can be able to cover. Uh, back to you, Mario. We've had gotten some really great questions in the chat. So I'm gonna ask Musa to pick what he sees as being the most recurrent. And George, thank you so much for that. I, I really appreciate that angle. And I'm sure the entire audience does, but Musa, if you could um, identify your- Yeah. Common so, thanks so much, George. I think that, you know, like it gives us a lot of food for thought, um, especially about the, the assumptions that are made on both sides of the aisle. Um, on the private side and also on the public side about intentions. And I think that relates back to what Marco was saying at the top of the hour. Um, so we're getting a few questions in, in, in the chat and obviously uh, some of those questions are getting ahead of, of some of what we're going to mention a little later. But I think something that we should probably bring up right now is this question that we, uh, it's kind of a recurring question that we're getting about working and trust building in the fragile state or post-conflict context or in states where corruption is endemic um, to government operations. Um, and I don't know if any of you have specific, you know, thoughts on this, um, you know, how you, you kind of build trust for the business environment in that type of context. Um, Frank, I, I, I'm immediately thinking of you because I know of your work in, in certain countries. Um, and I, I don't know if you have a, a specific perspective and want to share about that, but Anybody is free to, to jump in here. Sure, Musa, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll relate um, a bit of information from Sudan where I just was a couple of weeks ago. Um, so Sudan, I think everybody knows, is in a pretty rough spot, um, especially when it comes to trust between um, certainly the independent business sector and the government. Um, and you probably know also that Sudan is a is a leading, perhaps I think now the leading export of gold in in Africa, and much of that gold trade um, is either controlled by the military regime that's now in power, or um, Russian mercenary groups, specifically the the Wagner Group. Um, and so I had the privilege when I was in Khartoum to speak to folks who had just been released from jail. They were civil society activists uh, from the business community um, who'd been jailed because they were were taking part in democracy protests. And they described to me this situation in the jail where all the political prisoners were kept together, people that had been arrested for their democracy work, many of them from the business community, many of them entrepreneurs. And they described this, the feeling of solidarity and trust that was emerging from this community. And this is sort of well-trod territory, right? That the prisons are, especially when the politicals are put together, they're, they're wonderfully fertile places for trust building, for idea sharing, for reaching a sense of consensus and solidarity that then can lead to powerful democratic movements. Obviously, Sudan's in an early stage of this, but you could see it at work and you could see the essential role that the business community was playing, the, the small business community, of course. So that, that's one extreme that was heartening. These are brave, courageous people. It's always a privilege to spend time with them. On the other side, end of the spectrum, I would point to our work in Thailand. So Thailand, you know, an economically vibrant, highly corrupt environment where about 12 years ago, we launched a program to get together the, the biggest businesses in Thailand that were frustrated with the level of corruption, didn't trust the government to take any action, but were determined to stay part of the global financial uh, economic structure. And to do that, what they did was they created a, a, a pledge that they each took to put in place this very detailed set of anti-corruption measures, anti-corruption compliance program. At first, this was just a pledge. And then within a couple of years, they, they agreed that they would put them, make themselves subject to third party audits. So they would be judged specifically on whether they could, they did or did not hit these anti-corruption compliance marks in a public way. And if they didn't hit them, they would be suspended from this group. So that's a, that's a huge risk, requires trust in your fellow companies in the system. 
it's worked and you've got over 700 companies now that put themselves through this annual audit and are either in or outside. They either are certified or not certified. And they've created this bubble of integrity, which is now a sizable part of the economy, and which now can speak to the government about the reforms that are necessary to fight corruption. So that's sort of two ends of the spectrum, but I think they capture the degree of trust that's necessary, certainly within the business community, to push forward anti-corruption reforms and to bring about change. I like that a lot, Frank, because I think um, what, what you've kind of explained, and, and, and thanks to all of the, the, the attendees who've kind of raised this, this question about working in uh, the co conflict or post-conflict environment, right? And, and I like the, the way that you framed your response to that, Frank, because there's this idea of inclusion, right? <laughs> At first, you started talking, obviously, about Sudan in the context in which there was something, it seems like something grassroots is kind of happening, where all of these, um, you know, entrepreneurs end up in a common space because of the actions or the, you know, the, the kind of advocacy or what they're voicing. And it actually, uh, you know, something meant to punish them somewhat backfires because it leads to a, a, a kind of grassroots movement in which they kind of, come together and converge around certain ideas, right? And then in the Thailand example, I like quite a bit that in this space where government was either unwilling or unable to do something, these businesses kind of develop their own kind of system on their own to be able to be an interlocutor with the government. And, and, and I think that's really, it, it one addresses the issue of inclusion, right? Maybe businesses that might normally be marginalized because they're not the big businesses or not they're not the businesses that are somehow um, part of the elite capture system, if you will. Um, but I think it also, you know, kind of speaks to this notion that business itself, um, like the, the responsibility doesn't rest with government alone. Business itself can organize to achieve some of these goals. Um, so thank you, because I, I, I'm glad that you brought in that example, because it was going to be one of one of my questions for one of the topics on on inclusion. So perfect. Margo, did you have something you wanted to say? I was it's so funny because I don't have a raise my hand. So I actually have to like physically raise my hand. I was actually going to offer because I mean, Moose, you touched on the inclusion piece of it. And I know that um, that's something that we wanted to ask these speakers a little bit later. But what do you think about asking them now since we're on that topic? I, I think that's perfect. This conversation is open and it's supposed to go in whichever direction it goes, right? So yeah. let's go ahead with the inclusion has a, question. We have a good trusting working relationship and I'm great. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay, so for our audience, um, we're, you know, there's multiple topics here. So this one is ensuring inclusion, promoting broad private sector representation and dialogue. Musa, do you have a little bit um, of a, like a context before we ask our speakers the question? Yeah, I, I think so. My thoughts on this relate a bit to what Frank was saying, right? Uh, my job at the agency is often to help our mission, so th those are basically, you know, our, our USAID representation in various countries, help our missions to design activities um, that bring the private sector into the business environment and, you know, um, create a more enabling environment for, for those private sector entities. And oftentimes I, I get into these conversations um, with colleagues about, oh, well, we want to work with the private sector. And something that I, uh, undoubtedly always says, okay, you want to work with the private sector, but what does that mean? And immediately there's a tendency to, for us to kind of start going towards, well, these are the businesses that I know of, et cetera. But really, who are the, what are the businesses that we are trying to help, right? What are the businesses that are potentially being excluded from the conversation? Do they actually have agency to be able to participate in this conversation? Who's representing them? Um, so, you know, those are kind of some of the thoughts that I bring to the table in those discussions to make sure that we, we kind of bring as many businesses into the conversation to make sure that we really are, um, you know, addressing the concerns of those that need it most, not the ones that are already visible, right? Um, so, so with that said, Margaret, I think, you know, we, we can move on to one of our questions uh, that's related to inclusion as well. Yeah, thank you. So this is going to be for all three of you, but George, we are going to start with you. Um, so same question for all three of you. In your experience, what types of businesses are usually excluded from representation? And of course, it's contextual with the work and the research and the activities that you're doing. So we're prepared for very different answers. 
Yeah, so I think from my end, I'll, I'll say uh, small businesses and businesses of uh, young people, as well as business of other uh, typically marginalized uh, underrepresented groups, uh, like women, for example, and so on. And, and essentially, although, they are, I mean, for especially developing countries, they, are, they form the majority of uh, em uh, employment opportunities for, for, for young people, especially, they tend not to have space uh, at the table in many of these conversations. They don't even have a way of being reached so that they can participate. Yeah, so I think uh, I can allow my other colleague, uh, guests to share this uh, on this. Thank you. Frank, how about you? Um, so talking about types of businesses usually excluded from representation in, in your work and your research. So totally agree with, with George. Those are precisely the same, the folks that we spend a lot of time working with I would just add to the list um, companies that that speak truth to power, right? So companies that are rare, um, but but significantly in size, companies that will will criticize the government for corrupt behavior, because um, that's typically a tremendous risk to themselves. Um, so they are often very deliberately excluded from from conversations. And then Will. Yeah, I'll, I'll really echo Frank and George on, on their points too. Uh, and maybe tagging on to a point George made in terms of just being able to reach the businesses and how much of a role uh, technology plays in day-to-day -day lives now in many cases and how different levels of, of either digital literacy and knowing how to use the technology or even, even having access to it could influence the the inadvertent um, bias towards who you're engaging with. If you're gonna engage with emails, uh, you know, using internet in some way, that's already restricting the pool of folks that, that you're engaging with. Well, I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned that um, because it links to one of the topics um, that was announced in, in, um, in the original flyer for the event which is about leveraging technology for um, you know, public-private dialogue and really hearing from the firms um, and the private sector. And I know that you've obviously um, written a paper on taking uh, public-private dialogue online. And I, I wanted you to maybe give us a sense for what that looks like. What is you know, kind of tech-enabled uh, public-private dialogue um, and, you know, how, how does it really facilitate, um, how does tech facilitate the conversation between the public and private sectors? Yeah, definitely an area of, of growing interest, I would say, uh, given the um, availability to, to spread access to internet and the use of, of both SMS messaging, but smartphones, the, the widespread use of smartphones in many cases really opens up a lot of communication channels potentially. Um, and so that the idea with the, the tech enabled approach to public private dialogue is that, you know, in theory, it will be designed in a way that we're reaching more people, more groups than would otherwise be uh, can be providing their feedback in, in an analog environment or, or in just a more restricted uh, environment in terms of who's being connected with. Um, the use of the technology would also be meant to help support the, the speed of feedback so that if I'm a small business owner uh, participating in a tech-based uh, feedback mechanism, um, in, Ideally, the use of the technology will help support the, the rapid closing of the feedback loop as well, so that once I provide feedback, I get a sense of what is being done as a result of that feedback too. Um, so those being some of the major topics there. there there's also kind of this tangential category of um, like, uh, participatory decision-making, participatory budgeting, that are often using uh, technology to you know, collectively make decisions uh, by incorporating folks who would otherwise you know, have to travel a long ways to be able to participate in a forum um, or otherwise provide their, their voice to, to a decision at hand. 
Thanks. Thanks for that. Will be uh, and 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 I I kind of um, I picked up on some language from from your paper that I I kind of do want to emphasize here for everyone. But it's this notion that when you kind of work with tech um, for the purpose of public private dialogue, the the end goal is basically to have data driven public sector, right? So the data the 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 public sector has this opportunity in. I wouldn't necessarily say real time, but near real time, at least a lot faster than you would in an analog setting, kind of have the feedback of how various regulations or government actions are having an impact on businesses, on firms. It gives those firms an opportunity to also comment on uh, proposed actions or regulations or laws or changes. And it, it's a very participatory model. Um, so, so, Will, I'm so glad that, you know, you've kind of uh, brought up that topic and and um, you know, kind of enlightened us a little bit about how you would use uh, tech to enhance public-private dialogue. Thank you so much. I, I'm gonna take a quick second to look over at our at our chat here, Margo. I don't see. I don't know if there are any specific questions that have come up for you that you see that you want to bring up. Why don't you? But I'm also looking. I'm gonna summarize what I've seen. So I'm going to take your time to read it because we have such awesome attendees. Um, and then when I'm done with my spiel. You can just throw it out there. Um, so I will give, I think this is really for the speaker's benefit and then to acknowledge the audience questions. What I'm seeing is a real request for practical intervention examples, right? So we've seen questions about what the heck do you do? Um, you know, obviously in like a, in a post-war country situation, what do you do um, when like a relationship between the government and a certain private enterprise has already been broken? Um, so I am going to challenge and request from our speakers, um, whatever question Musa pulls out, let's start thinking about like the really practical interventions. Is it like hosting a meeting? Okay, I'm a communicator. So these examples are just from my perspective. Please do share your more researched and practiced perspectives. But for me, it would be, okay, do we need to host a meeting? Do we need to have a, like a private session? Do we need to do more communications about um, how we got here, you know, things like that. So I think um, really specific examples of interventions, it seems to be what our audience is craving. All right, so Musa, did that give you enough time to pick um, pick one? It did. Um, th there is a question that I, I kind of, I, I wanna bring forward here by, by one of our colleagues, uh, Janine Mance, uh, who asked in the chat, um, what should you do if, uh, what should you do if the standard bearers of private sector interests uh, for example, business chambers are not trusted or trustworthy. How can you avoid cherry picking those firms that are well connected from being the focus of our work? Um, and, and I think, you know, this this kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about working with our various missions to make sure that we are targeting um, the right uh, parts of the private sector and that we don't just have a we don't have a skewed view of, of the private sector and its needs or firms and their needs right so I don't know if, if any of you have some additional thoughts on how you make sure that you you kind of bring a, a diverse pool together um, to kind of advocate for the private sector or to make sure that you are working with a diverse pool of private sector representatives that represent the whole of the private sector and not just a specific subset either in in a, in a sector or a, a subset that might be um the juggernaut if you will in 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 the space um i don't know if any of you have any specific thoughts on that um go ahead frank so so janine's question and it's good to see you janine is, is spot on um because so typically if you had an association of say multinationals they have one you know a, a set of very specific goals that they're pursuing and those may not align with what, what your goals are. And by the same token, if you have um, a, an association of the largest companies in the country, they too may not be pursuing things that are, are useful because they're perfectly happy with the status quo. Unfortunately, those business associations, whether formal or informal, that are pursuing what you wanna pursue, they may not have the capacity or knowledge or, or just the skills to interact with you. So it takes a lot of effort to build up those relationships, engage them, and, and it can take years. But when you do, they are incredibly powerful advocates for precisely the agenda that I think most of the folks on this call are, are pursuing. But it takes effort. And it's typically it's fairly small scale. So a large donor may not be in a position to contract or you know sort of engage with them in a meaningful way through traditional mechanisms. 
And that's why it's so important to, to be able to have partners, interlocutors on the ground who can do that work for you. Um, and the sums, the, the, the resources often are quite small, very small. And often you don't want to pump too much money into this because it could distort everything and it doesn't become real anymore. So it's a challenge, but when you make the effort, that's where you'll find the dividends, I think. Thank you so, so much, this is Frank. Not, uh, yeah, George, yeah, thank you. This is not uh, my area of expertise, but uh, one of the areas that I see as an opportunity that is underexploited uh, in, in this context is um, usually you find small businesses and uh, especially when uh, women businesses tend to have uh, more of like some savings and um, most many of them are informal savings groups uh, in, in, in our region here we call them chamas but kind of some savings groups loaning and savings uh, groups that are sometimes are small some of them grow big uh, some are registered but most of these groups are only primarily I only use for saving and yet there are opportunities for engaging uh, with uh, say uh, non-governmental organization working in this kind of space and even donors to begin to get into other uh, areas like some shaping policy, identifying issues that are affecting small businesses uh, and they tend to meet regularly. So I think that's one area that can be exploited. I like think about some practical things that can be done so that they can uh, become like as some form of small associations for small businesses. Perfect. Thank you so much, Frank. Um, Marco, I think that you there there is obviously a question that you wanted to ask about the role of development partners. Maybe we can go with that one. Yeah, thank you. And then Musa, I would actually really like to hear your take on this as well. Um, so this is really for all of us, um, or Musa, you can kick it to whoever <laughs> you think would be more appropriate. Um, so what role do development partners play in this shifting the landscape? So, you know, all developer partners don't work in the same contexts. Given that USAID predominantly works in the least developed economies. What do you think are the major priorities for building trust into the business environment in these countries? Um, Musa, I don't know if you wanna give me context or if you wanna pick someone. To yeah, so I think obviously, um, well, oftentimes when we talk about public-private dialogue and we're talking about it, especially in the context of tech-enabled public-private dialogue, we may be talking about a specific subset of, of economies that have that are sufficiently uh, advanced in e-government to be able to facilitate that, right? Um, but I think that, you know, in terms of, there, there are so many other strategies um, to build public-private dialogue. And, uh, and I'm, I'm interested in how we as a, a development partner, and when I say we, we USAID, that focuses on the, the least developed economies, um, what, what should our priorities really be in this space? And if there, if there are specific thoughts that, um, that our, our guests have on that. I, I obviously have my thoughts um, about, you know, sometimes there's, there's focusing on the private sector directly, but sometimes the private sector isn't necessarily yet organized in the way that you need. That you need. So there's that aspect of building the private sector's capacity altogether, right? To be able to actually voice their opinion, to be able to hold the government accountable, um, to, to basically understand uh, government regulation and to be able to, to, to point out asymmetries of information like Will talked about earlier. And then there is also the role that, um, you know, other parties or other parts of civil society play, including the media, including youth, um, including academia, um, where they kind of play this, this role in between, where they can bring transparency um, in places where government isn't necessarily able to or hasn't yet. They can also hold um, businesses accountable for uh, uh, illicit activities that they're engaging in and the kind of distortions that they might be creating in the market. So those are kind of the, you know, the, maybe some of the less traditional angles that we can take or areas that we can work in from my, my perspective, right? Um, but I do want to hand it to, 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 to the guests as well, if they have specific thoughts on, you know, what development partners like USAID working in the least developed economies should prioritize. I don't know if any of you have specific thoughts on this. 
or if members of our audience want to chime in as well. So, um, Musa, if it's okay, I just had one thing to add. So I think that, at least from my point of view, I spent so much of my time in sort of techno technocratic searches for solutions and, you know, in this kind of Wonka sphere where I am, you know, interacting with fellow anti-corruption nerds about the latest solution to the, the newest problem. But in reality, in many of the markets where we work, you really, you need to have a simple narrative about why this matters to people and why, you know, corruption and the private sector impacts their daily lives, whether it's loss of tax revenue or perversion of the market or, you know, not accessing credit, whatever it is. But that's, you need to have a simple, compelling narrative. And it's so easy, at least for me, to lose sight of that when much of my work day is spent on, on the act, exact opposite end of the spectrum. So that's those stories, those powerful stories and are really, really important. The people best able to tell them are the ones on the ground in the countries themselves. That's a, I think that that point is also well taken. I think that there, there is generally, um, you know, in, in a lot of the of work that we do as development partners, there's a tendency to look at a lot of international benchmarks as, as context indicators of how we intervene and how, you know, we try to address a private sector um, or, you know, SME related issues. And I think, Frank, part of what you're pointing to is that there is really some level of ground level work that needs to be done to kind of understand the problems and how they change from one locality to the next, but also how they differ depending on the development context. So thank, thank you, thank you for um, for bringing that up. And, and Janine is saying Wonkosphere, I love that. So <laughs> I don't know, Will and George, if you have any specific thoughts. Um, George, for, for you in particular, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I do have questions or I, I, I'm wondering if you can say something about the inclusion of youth, because I think that, I, I don't know if you would necessarily consider the, the groups that you work with as youth, um, but they, they definitely are relatively uh, young entrepreneurs and, and members of civil society and government. So if you have any comments on that. Yeah, so maybe just one um, addition I can make. Any work that involves uh, uh, especially young people and uh, may require like uh, changes at, at a police level or a much higher level uh, requires bring young people together uh, so that they work kind of creating networks of young people. Uh, collectively, young people can push for a lot of uh, their interests, but at in, an individual level, it, it becomes very difficult. So I think any work that USAID supports, especially in, in, in any space that uh, may require some form of uh, changes in policy, pushing governments in certain directions, there must be a component of uh, supporting building of youth, networks of youth within that particular area of interest, because that is the only way then uh, the government will pay attention and even uh, policymakers, and also just their own, for their own visibility. That's the only way that that can be achieved. Yeah, back to you. I, I like that quite a bit, George, because I think what you're, you're also pointing to here is this notion that, um, you know, youth uh, need to be included in the process because they are the, the, the you know, they are the future, right? And, and trust isn't something that we build or develop in you know a couple months <laughs> it's something that can take years sometimes generations and so this the work that you're doing I, I particularly appreciate because it's creating the fertile ground for that trust relationship to develop so i, I really do want to say thank you so much for the for the great work that you're doing in in this space um, as someone who's leading this 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 intervention for, for east africa um, will i don't know if you have any thoughts on this um, but feel free to chime in and no pressure. Yeah, sure. Well, maybe continuing on what George was describing with that, the importance of the social interaction piece uh, is opportunities to help communicate uh, competency and, and integrity. I think our, the, it's not always a huge lift required to be to communicate that. I mean, it could be done very simply as a part of a, a communication campaign or an awareness campaign, um, but it can be done in more complex situations as well. I'm thinking of there have been some studies around the idea of uh, operational transparency 
and the way in, in this particular case, it was a US-based case, but it was looking at how understanding what government is doing and the different steps that are being taken to address different issues that have been come up, seeing the, each, seeing the gears moving and all the people involved and what the roles of those different people are creates this increased uh, sense of trust. You see what's happening, uh, what, in terms of you see what was previously behind the scenes. Once you see it, you have greater appreciation for it and there can be that element of trust. Um, but I think there's a, there's a variety of ways that groups have gone about communicating competency and integrity. And I guess on your note, Musa, with regard to, um, well, development partners and civil society, I know on the public procurement side of things, there's the group Transparency International that helps facilitate uh, integrity packs that they tend, I think they tend to be for larger uh, public contracts, but they have this role of um, oftentimes being uh, broadly publicly communicated to show that there's this additional element of integrity built into the public contracting process and it involves the uh, oversight of this Transparency International chapter or third party social witnesses. Um, but so sometimes I think there's small ways that, uh, or small small activities that can be conducted, especially some of these examples are on the public sector side, but they may apply on the private sector side as well. Um, but noting those and then being able to effectively communicate those out and broadly uh, so that there's that greater appreciation for government activities occurring may help. Thank you so much, Will, um, and and thank you particularly for your for mentioning that a uh, bit about um, the the packs um, and uh, this kind of echoes a comment that we received in the chat. And I'm sorry if I if I, if, I, if I'm not pointing to the person who said this. Um, it was actually communicated to me by our producers, but I think echoes very nicely what you're saying about um, about kind of procurement um, and the role that um, development partners can play. And the person said, USAID can work as an influencer and can advise business enabling policies as a prerequisite for their PPP funding, sort of capacity building through contracting. Um, and I think that's a really good summary of some of what you're saying as well. Um, and I wanted to make sure that I, I, I kind of highlighted that before I hand it over to Margot. Um, I'm so glad that we, you know, for, for the majority of the, uh, of, of the of the webinar, we've kind of kept the viewership uh, for nearly the entire time. We've had a few people start to drop off, um, but it, this is this is really uh, great to me to know that so many people are interested in this. Um, unfortunately, obviously, we can't get to all the questions. Um, but like I said, if this is a topic of interest, we can see about doing uh, more in this series. Obviously, uh, Margot, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, thank you. And I will ask our production team, Abby, maybe if you could go ahead and copy and paste um, the biographical information of the three speakers, just so if the audience um, wants to like follow up with them or learn more about them or, or try to connect, if you could paste that in the chat. Um, if, so for everybody to know, they posted it like very at the beginning of the event, but maybe posting it again would be really helpful. Um, yes, yeah, so we have seven minutes left. We have reached the final part of the webinar. So um, to our awesome attendees, this was so much fun to see you connecting um, to some of our speakers who were able to engage in the chat as well. Certainly to everybody on camera who we were able to answer some of those questions that were very off the cuff. I know they were unexpected. Um, we're really grateful. Uh, before we close out, I do just want to hear from each of you one last time. And um, we're basically just asking you to leave us with a concluding thought. Now, we talked about a lot. So um, this is really just like personal preference or, you know, something that you'll just really want this big group of people to know either about your work or advice um, or anything like that. So um, it's going to go George, Frank, and Will. So George, we're going to start with you. So any final thoughts here, please? Um, just one. Uh, thank you so much. And it, this was a, a, a very helpful event for me learning a lot. I think just to mention that in any work we're doing, especially in developing economies, uh, really think about the role young people can play, uh, not only as beneficiaries, but uh, really as agents of change, so that we invest in that, we, we can be able to reap the fruits 
uh, in a few years time. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Frank. It looks like, oh, there you are. Frank, please go ahead. Yeah, I just popped out to get a, a book that I was gonna recommend that folks read. So it's, um, it's called The Conundrum of Corruption. It's written by one of my favorite anti-corruption academics, Michael Johnston, um, who's now retired, but, but wrote this book about a year ago. So he makes a point that I've, I've come to subscribe to after about a decade in this field, which is that anti-corruption, well, two points. One is that the sort of anti-corruption industry, right, which, which I think is a, it's a somewhat cynical way to describe um, certainly, certainly the, the, the body of businesses around the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and reducing risk for big companies, but also to some extent to be very candid with the folks in the development world as well. Um, and he, he talks about that in a very constructive way. And then more importantly, he talks about that you can't just look at anti-corruption by itself. It's part of the best way to look at it is, is through a, a social justice lens. Because fundamentally, when you're motivating people to, to, to change behaviors, corrupt behaviors, you're, you're appealing to social justice um, issues. And that's, that also goes back to my point about creating a narrative. Fundamentally, those narratives resonate most deeply when they're grounded in social justice issues and the equitable distribution of resources. And this doesn't have to be some sort of you know, right left um, issue. It doesn't have to be a political issue. It's just a, an issue of distribution of resources. And the more we can take that holistic approach and look for example at environmental issues and labor issues um, as well as corruption and how corruption undermines the ability to, to hit the right standards on labor and environment, the better off I think we'll be and we'll, we'll be certainly be more impactful. So that, those are my closing words and just thanks so much for having me here. I've learned a lot. Thank you. And Will, please. Um, well, you know, kind of continuing on the lines of where, what Frank was describing with the element of, of having that narrative, I'll just going back to this whole behavioral insights, behavioral economics topic, I'll just encourage folks to have that in mind as they're thinking about uh, trust oriented interventions, or if trust is a is a co-objective alongside other uh, policy reform objectives that may be on folks' mind. So thinking about trust, the different forms it could take, uh, if there's any measures of it in place, and how these the very human uh, aspects of of understanding the the value of it, with you know understanding the the emotional factors, the social norms, having all of those in, in your mind as you're moving through these interventions, I think will be helpful going forward. Um, and echoing George and Frank as well, I think I appreciate uh, joining this, this event as well. Really, really informative. Thank you. Um, our speakers really did put in a lot of effort here and, and we're comfortable um, and very trusting with this format. So we appreciate it. But I do also um, want to give some credit to my co-host here, Musa, um, before I, I hand the microphone to him. Um, this event was really, really, he, he came up with this um, on his own, Musa did. He really pulled inspiration um, from the work of the three speakers. So Musa really deserves a lot of credit for this event. Um, and it's also just wonderful to be able to hear another smart person um, close out with any final thoughts. So Musa, put in the giving you the microphone, if you could um, just give us some final thoughts for the audience. Mar Marga, you're giving me too much credit, but I, I do want to say thank you for, for really helping to facilitate this. And, and, you know, as a communicator, as somebody who thinks about things in a much broader way than I do, thank you for making me think about the critical things to, to really uh, engage in this discussion. Thank you to Frank and Will and George for all of your contributions. In terms of takeaways, I want us all to remember that trust is about having a relationship and that relationship is ever changing. Um, the, the, you know, the, the motivations of the individuals that are involved is changing, which is why behavioral economics is important. It can often take generations for that change to come about. So we need to really consider um, who we're engaging with um, in building the trust relationship and make sure that we have a, an inclusive representation of the private sector, that we also include the, the youth in the conversation. We can obviously also use technology to, to facilitate some of these conversations around trust. Um, and you know, the, 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 the goal here is for us to have started this conversation here where we talk about trust and how it feeds into the business environment. 
um, and into public-private dialogue or how public-private dialogue advances trust. But I hope this is just the beginning of the conversation um, as we continue to brainstorm collectively. So I'm looking forward to reconnecting with all of you and continuing this conversation. Thank you so much. All right, thanks everybody. So this session is going to be posted to Resonance and to Market Link soon. So please do feel free to share with any colleagues or trusted partners who you uh, think might find it interesting. Um, in the meantime, for our audience and certainly our speakers, keep up your bold efforts and actions to continue strengthening the capacities for our partner countries and improving the regulations to promote better business environments. So for um, everybody attending, we do have another webinar coming up on August 4th, um, and that is going to be Trade Facilitation, The Road Ahead. Um, it's another one of uh, USAID's um, Economics and Market Development colleagues. It should be really exciting. You'll see some communications about that soon. Um, and this information will be posted through market links and other social media. So thanks again, everybody. This was a, a really great event and we really appreciate the audience participation. Truly, it really made it what it was. Thank you all so much. Have a great one.